we will start with the demo and then i will uh, give an introduction to the domain because this is a medical domain we will not be able to appreciate the code or the ui unless we know a little bit about the domain so i'll give a quick overview of the domain then we'll go into the code uh, to some extent yeah i am also not an expert uh, in the react code but uh, whatever i have been able to pick up in this project i will share with you so i hope this sounds interesting uh, let's get started i'll start by sharing my screen okay you should see my screen now ramanathan can you see the screen yes okay okay thank you yeah so this is the article uh, i have been writing on devopedia just to uh, understand for myself uh, this topic a little bit better but we will not look at this right now let's go and look at the demo first so it so happens that uh, this particular software there is already a demo running online and uh, that demo can be accessed at this url viewer.ohif.org this one is using an older version of the software this is actually version 2.9.0 as you can see here uh, there is also a newer version of the software which is running uh, online and that has a slightly different url v3-demo.ohif.org so this is the updated ui uh, so let's look at the demo on this one rather than looking at uh, the previous version so when the software loads uh, this is the kind of uh, view you get it is called as a study list and uh, so you can see a list of uh, items here and each one is called a study and every study pertains to one particular patient so that is one thing to keep in mind and uh, if you open up any particular study you will find that uh, a study has multiple series and the series are numbered 1 2 3 6 7 and so on and uh, the reason for this is uh, you know uh, you uh, it is very likely that the hospital has done multiple scans of the patient maybe uh, on the same day or over a course of days or weeks so different scans at different uh, dates and times of the same patient uh, have been done so that is one thing there is also a date here start date end date so you can do some filtering i suppose so uh, now let's look at uh, one particular study let's take this particular patient i think uh, so now all the data that we see here they are from real patients but uh, for the purpose of the demo the scans have been anonymized so you won't find any real names or addresses of the patients okay what we see are uh, what we are going to see are real data but they are not uh, they have been anonymized so let's take a look at uh, one of those uh, studies and this is the kind of view that comes up so you can see first of all from the perspective of performance and the usability it looks pretty nice the color combination the use of fonts uh, background so it looks nice and uh, when we move to a page you know it loads pretty quickly and things are smooth so here we have the main image opened up uh, and i suppose this corresponds to one of the uh, studies which are here uh, let's take this one so if you look at this uh, this is what is known as uh, series so there are multiple series here and each one uh, has multiple images so this one as you can see has two images the next one has 60 images this one has 55 images and so on right so we can take a look at uh, one of them for example body 5.0 lung so this is a lung scan so we need to double click and then the scan comes up now there are actually 60 images in the scan now you may be wondering why there are so many images because many of these uh, equipment whether it's a mri or a ct scan Uh, they don't take a single image they take slices of the body so you will end up with multiple images in a single scan and th this is exactly what is happening here and this particular scan was done on 25th march 2014 and if you click here you get 
a little bit pop up giving details of the patient, uh, sex, age, some patient number, etc., some details of the scan. So this should be considered as a metadata. So that is important to keep in mind. So the system or the data that is coming into the system is not just images. You also have quite a lot of metadata giving information or uh, useful information about each image. Now uh, this one has, as I said, 60 images, so you can move on to subsequent images by clicking, right? And uh, you can also scroll down like this. And if you scroll down, you see that how the image changes. There is some continuity because this is exactly what a scanning machine does, depending on the scan, of course. But in this case, it takes different slices around that body part. Now you can also play this as a video. So within the software, you can play it as a video. So there is a uh, action here called Cine. So now it takes a default 24 frames per second and then you play it. So automatically it plays. So these are kind of tools which are important to surgeons, doctors, radiologists who are continuously looking at these scans. And look at the UI, it's, uh, it's very nice. You don't need a standalone application. Everything is built in React, which means that for the surgeon or radiologist, they can run this from any standard browser. They don't need to install anything on their system. So this is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this React based application has become popular. And it is uh, popular that uh, even uh, popular cloud platforms like uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, they have integrations with this platform. OK, so this is uh, uh, some of the things I wanted to show. So you can go to some other series, right? You can double click this. That particular series will load. So this one has uh, like 81 images. You can also uh, like uh, do a grid layout. So suppose you want to view multiple images at the same time. So you can load this image here, scroll down, and then over here you can load another image, scroll down that image. So you can do a comparative study. So all that uh, is possible here. There is much more to the software because uh, actual radiologists, they will do something called measurements, segmentation. So some of these things, uh, some of these tools are available on the right side in the side panel. And the left side, you have the studies. In the center, you have the main, uh, what they call as a viewport. Now, uh, in this version of the software, if the user wants more uh, area, viewing area for the viewport, they can minimize this. And everything collapses and expands smoothly. Right? You can change the number of grids and the art images will automatically adjust. So there is a lot of performance enhancing technology that's being used uh, under the hood. We can uh, look at some of them later. So uh, so this is what it is uh, at a high level. And here you have information about the software preferences. So you can select to view this package in some other language. I have not tried it. So let's say if I put Japanese, what happens? Okay. Okay, so this menu here has changed. So uh, most of it is same except for the menu. So so here things are different as you can see. Yeah. So this is uh, what is already hosted on the web. Now let's run this locally. So what I have done is I have already taken a clone because it's an open repository. I have a clone of the repository locally. And all I have to do is do a yarn dev. So it will start the deployment locally. And it uses uh, Lerna build system. Uh, some of you may be familiar. Uh, anyone knows about Lerna? What can you tell me about Lerna? Anyone? While this is just coming up, we'll have that interaction. Surely you must have heard about Lerna. So Lerna is a build system whereby you can, it helps you to manage multiple packages from a single repository. So, uh, you know, uh, 
this is becoming more and more common in some large projects where uh, they want to share code across projects. Even in Google, I have been told that uh, they are uh, favoring mono repos. So what is a mono repo? Mono repo simply is a single code repository from which multiple packages are managed. So you may be releasing multiple packages, but they are all managed in the single GitHub repository. And Lerna is one of those tools that helps you to kind of uh, uh, make the releases from a single repository. So it's kind of becoming popular these days. So this has done using Webpack. It has uh, built the system and then uh, yeah, adding things into the bundle and stuff like that and then starting the app locally. So it might have already come up. So, so here it is. So you can see here, this is running on local host 3000 port. Okay. So it's exactly same thing that we saw in the live demo uh, online. Uh, same is available here uh, on my system because uh, probably the, it is connecting to the same data source. Uh, so the data itself is not on my system. The data is coming from a uh, separate third, uh, like it's a separate server called a DICOM server, which I will talk about shortly. So, so far, any questions? So it's still early. If you have any questions quickly, we can answer that. I'll try to answer that. Okay, let's move on. So now let me uh, uh, look at the architecture. So before we, uh, so we already looked at the UI briefly. So we see how it is, but how is this whole thing working? So take a look at uh, what happens. I mean, uh, it's interesting. We, uh, I'm sure all of us at, at some point have gone to a hospital and we have uh, been scanned CT scan or X-ray or something. But uh, probably we have never wondered uh, how that image is captured and where it goes. So most likely we, it goes to a server, but beyond that, uh, we don't know what exactly happens to an image. Uh, the first question to ask is, uh, I mean, this is a scanning machine. First question to ask is, uh, what is the format of the image? So we expect that it will be a common format uh, like uh, JPEG or PNG or maybe even WebP which is unlikely in a scanning machine. But it so happens that uh, those kind of formats are not uh, sufficient. They are being used in medical imaging, but they are not sufficient for uh, uh, this domain. The reason is along with uh, image metadata, they also want to capture patient metadata with every image. That is the first thing. The second thing is every scan will give you multiple images you are not going to get single image for that scan. So there should be a way to uh, kind of uh, uh, assemble or aggregate multiple images into a single format, into a single file. So that is where uh, they have uh, the medical profession or medical domain people have invented a format called DICOM. So D-I-C-O-M. So whatever comes out of a machine, so most of the machines or at least modern machines the images they throw out will be in the DICOM format or DICOM compatible format. And uh, obviously these images, once they are scanned by the machine, they are not going to either reside in the machine or go to a particular desktop. They will be actually sent to a server. So now it is very likely that the hospital or research institute will have a DICOM server for storing all these images. Actually the server is here, this is a router. Yeah. So this is the router which routes the images uh, to the DICOM server. Now the terminology used in medical domain is uh, PACS. So this is a picture archival and communication system. Now there are so many different types of uh, PACS systems out there. One of the systems is the DICOM server. So which is what uh, we are using in today's demo. So that uh, we are getting all the images from a DICOM server. Right, and we are actually here sitting here. So we are, uh, I am seeing this on my laptop as if a radiologist would see it on his workstation. So basically here my React app is running. The app connects 
to the DICOM server and pulls images from the DICOM server. These images themselves are coming from any scanning machine which will be throwing out images in the DICOM format. So this is all there is to the system. The other things are uh, ex extra details of this workflow uh, of other parallel work workflows which we are not interested today. So there could be a query and retrieval system for looking at images. So that is a VNA. They call it a vendor neutral archival system or something like that. Then uh, more recently, this is coming up uh, as an increasing mode of uh, operation where AI models are being introduced to work with the fax system. So now what will happen? An AI model will pull images from fax. It will uh, an analyze the images. Maybe it will do image segmentation. Maybe it will do annotation on the images. And then the radiologist will tap both the fax as well as the AI models to aid his decision making. So increasingly these parts of the workflows are becoming uh, common. That is the introduction of AI into this uh, medical imaging system. OK, so at this point, any questions before we move on? OK, if not uh, one final uh, bit of information. Now all the DICOM images are stored here. Our React app is pulling the DICOM images from here. But exactly what, what is the uh, interface that is used? What kind of APIs are exposed by the DICOM uh, server? So for that, people invented something called the DICOM web. Right? So they invented a standard called the DICOM web where DICOM images are accessible through a RESTful, through RESTful APIs. And there is, in fact, uh, I've given a link here to a cheat sheet how this works. So you can here see here, this is how our React app will get images from the DICOM web server so using the DICOM web uh, APIs. So from the structure of the URL path itself, you can make out uh, that it very much identifies with the structure we have seen on the UI. You have a bunch of studies. Then within each study, you have multiple series. Within each series, there are multiple images, which is called here as an instance. And that kind of a structure is clearly reflected in the URL path. So you can give queries, retrieve the images, and then you can post. So this is the kind of thing which, for example, a CT machine or MRI machine will do. Suppose it is web enabled. It is using uh, DICOM web as the interface then they can issue a post request to store images into the DICOM web server. But there will be, of course, a lot of legacy machines who are not using DICOM web, so they will use the older DICOM interface to transfer images to the server. So that older workflow is also there. Older interface is also present, uh, which older machines will use. OK, so uh, so this is important to know. So basically, uh, you know, uh, one of the things people like about uh, OHIF viewer is that it uses standardized interfaces. It is not inventing anything on its own. So DICOM web is a standardized interface and uh, it works uh, nicely with that. We can also see this here. So suppose, for example, I will right click here. So, so that we can inspect the requests that are going out in the network. And let's say I click lung basic viewer. So I click this immediately a request went out. And if I inspect this request, you can see here. I hope you can see it. Uh, the font is yeah, let me try to enlarge this. You can see the URL here. It is going to a cloud front URL. It is accessing a DICOM web server. It is exposed uh, in this path. Then studies, study number, series, and some parameters for that series. This is exactly what we saw in the uh, API documentation of DICOM web. So same structure, you can uh, see that in the request that goes out to the network. OK, so this is how the React app actually gets uh, data from the DICOM web server. Simple, it's just a REST API calls. 
and the data is not retrieved in advance. Data is retrieved uh, as we can see here. It is retrieved only when we enlarge this. Until then, it was not retrieved. So suppose I go and open something else, then for this particular series, a new request will go out and so on. So data is requested only on a, a, a need basis. OK, and likewise, suppose we go into a particular viewer to view this particular study, then the uh, relevant images will get downloaded. So you can see a lot of requests go out. And these are basically getting those images that you are going to be seeing here. OK. OK, any questions at this point? OK, no questions, so we'll move on. So that is the demo part. Now let's look at the architecture. So now we are going to go a little bit deeper. A little bit more technical, shall we say? So how is this whole app architected? So a useful slide will be the this slide, which is the this image, which is the architecture of uh, um, this app. So you can see here there is something called core. So this is the core of the app. But the UI itself is separate from the core. So in that sense, it is possible to use a, a part of this uh, OHF UI and use a completely different UI. If if somebody wants to do, do that, they have the flexibility to do it. And the reason for that is the architecture, the components of this architecture are decoupled. So UI is not dependent on core, core is not dependent on UI. Right? Uh, or more like core is not dependent on UI, which means that I can take this part of the uh, this package and use some other UI if I don't like this particular UI, which comes by default. Then there is a separate uh, package for the internationalization, like we in our case, as an example, we temporarily switched to Japanese. So we could see that uh, that is enabled by this I18N. Then there is the viewer. So viewer is the one that kind of brings things together. It uh, kind of tally uh, interfaces UI and the core. So core ob obviously has some core functionality, but it is the UR, UR, uh, viewer that brings all these parts together. So viewer makes the request to the DICOM server, gets the images, and then pushes the images to the UI. And that is how it works. So the CLI uh, itself, uh, it's uh, some command line tools. I have not explored this much. Then the other two important things which I'll talk about more, I'll talk about modes a little later, but the other important thing is extensions. So this is very common in the, the way we build software today. We don't put every little feature that we can think of into the core of the platform. So the core, we try to keep it minimal. So that makes it easier for us to install things. And then something that is extra, we deliver as extensions. So now these extensions can be, uh, obviously as the name suggests, they extend the functionality of the core, but they are kept kind of independent. So that if you if somebody doesn't want certain extensions, they need not install them. So that kind of flexibility is there. And this kind of separation also allows uh, a developer to build their own extensions and easily using the same framework integrate it with the core. So that is another reason why you know it's important to, uh, I mean, not only in this uh, software, for any software when you design it at a high at, at the architectural level, it is important to identify which are the core aspects of the product. And what are the other things that some users may want, some other users may not want. So those you should push it off to the extensions. OK. Then there are other tools on which uh, the viewer depends on. So for example, DICOM. So it's not that the OHF viewer has implemented its own parser to parse the DICOM images. No. There is already a third party package to parse DICOM images, so they are just importing that. Similarly, a lot of the UI is enabled by something called Cornerstone, which is a bunch of JavaScript libraries. And that is also an open source project. 
So I can show you that here. I probably have it here. Yes. So this is the cornerstone project on uh, GitHub. So you can see here it's basically a JavaScript library which helps us to display uh, medical images. Not only display, you can also process medical images because there are so many other uh, packages from this project. There is also Cornerstone 3D and then uh, further tools. Uh, there is a lo image loader from Cornerstone which is also being used by uh, the tool software we are talking about today. So OHIF viewer uh, need not implement all these things on its own. So this is kind of uh, it. Uh, kind of adopts the Cornerstone JavaScript library to uh, speed up the development. Now uh, you may be wondering, OK, all this is fine uh, and the documentation is also great. If you look at the documentation of uh, I must be having it open somewhere. Yeah, this is the documentation. If you read the documentation, it is quite amazing. Because this is not very typical of open source projects. Of course, successful open source projects have good documentation, but where, where there are successful open source projects, there is also a uh, industrial backing, some sort of a commercial enterprise backing it. So that's where you know good documentation comes out from. Uh, but here, uh, as an open source project, it is quite uh, surprising to see so so good documentation. And you may be wondering how did they make it happen? And that is because from the very beginning, this project has been funded. So a little bit of history on this project. Uh, the project started somewhere in 2015. Where uh, Gordon Harris from uh, Massachusetts uh, General Hospital, he got funding from the National Cancer Institute. And this funding continued for a good number of years. For five years, uh, this funding was alive. And uh, this is how the product developed over those uh, five years. And when the product was first released, uh, you know, 2015 or 16, it was actually not a React app. It, it was a Meteor full stack app, right? But then over time, React uh, became more popular and uh, the performance on React was obviously something people wanted to have in this app. So then in version two, that is in 2019, uh, they kind of migrated uh, from Meteor backend to a React a single page application. So what we see today is a single page application. So, uh, so that was version two. Then version three came out uh, quite recently. That is in uh, public beta came out in September 2021. And last year in August 2022, uh, sorry, November 2022, that is uh, what it's hardly two, three months. So the OHR viewer 3.3 came out. So now uh, one of the important. Uh, OK, the other thing is the in November 2020 and 2021, because the other funding stopped. Uh, so Chan Zuckerberg initiative, they also fund a lot of projects. So under this initiative, uh, they have been sponsoring a lot of open source projects which are important for science. So that is what uh, this group is uh, doing. Some of you may be aware of this. So this is called, uh, this is from uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and they have something called EOSS. So EOSS is Essential Open Source Software for Science. So under this program, this foundation or initiative gives funding. And if you see this page, it is quite interesting to read. What are all the kinds of projects which are funded under this uh, initiative? Like Scikit Image and Dash, they are funded here. Then you have SciPy is also funded uh, fully or partly. So like this, lot of packages, OpenSim, right? Bioconductor, so that is here. So a lot of uh, packages, okay which yeah, those of you who are from Python background, you may be familiar with this, okay. So likewise, uh, you know, this particular project, OHIF viewer is also funded by this one. So for that reason, and the uh, actual purpose of the funding is also very clear. When they give the funding, they make it very clear that it is for mentorship, that is for people who are working on this. 
and also it is for uh, improving the documentation. So that they made it clear what is the purpose of the funding, and that is one reason why the documentation on this project is uh, pretty good. Okay. So at this point, uh, I'll pause for questions. So this is the overall architecture of the uh, software. Any questions at this point? So now let's come to one of the important features of uh, version 3. So in version 3, they have introduced something called modes, and that is best understood by a demo. So let's go back to our demo. Uh, let's go to this. Go back to our list of studies and take an example. OK, here I may not have it. Uh, let's take my local demo. It's the same software. I think data is OK. It's coming from the same source. OK. So let me open this. Now if I open this, you see here, suppose I open this one. I have a basic viewer, but this one is disabled. Right. But if I look at this particular study, there are two different uh, uh, viewers or what they call as modes. Now we have already seen how what a basic viewer looks like, but in this particular study where you have PET scans and CT scans, a different sort of visualization is needed by the radiologist or the surgeon. So that is where uh, this software is so easily extendable that you can have easily extend the visualizations. So let's look at this particular one and you will see that the UI is now completely different. Uh, it's not loaded yet. Yeah. See, it loads very differently because automatically the layout is different. Previously, we used to see the list of studies on the left and then some tools on the right. But here you start with a multi grid layout. And then you have the tools on the right, but the tools are also different. A different set of tools are presented to us now. So the yeah, maybe my net issue, it is slow. But uh, I think you got the idea how it loads. Are you guys able to see my screen? Screen has gone blank uh, for me as well. Yes, we are able to see the screen, but blank screen. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, probably my uh, my side net is slow. Uh, so I stopped that. So the the idea that is the idea of modes, and this we can understand how it is uh, implemented, and I quite like the way it is done. So this image gives us a understanding how it is done. So you have a bunch of extensions. You have a bunch of routes which are, you know, how your URL, uh, what kind of URL you are going to use on a particular UI. Then you have your data sources, then you have your templates. Now you can take bits and pieces of this, combine them together, and you get what is known as an app configuration. And in their language, they call this a mode. This is one mode of present, one mode of uh, operating the viewer. Like this, you can have multiple modes in the same application. As we saw in our demo, we had two modes, basic uh, mode plus the other mode, uh, which was useful for looking at uh, PET scans and CT scans. So two modes are available. But of course, if you go online, let's say you take this block, for example, you can see here in this image, this installation has five different modes. And two modes are uh, kind of uh, activated for this particular study. That means for this particular study, these two modes make sense. So they have been activated. So the point is that for that day, uh, the same data, you can view it in different uh, ways within the same app. So that is the whole uh, beauty of uh, having modes. And this is something they introduced in uh, version three. OK, so this is uh, what it is. And uh, so now let's come to any questions at this point. Next, I will look at the code. We look at the code. So this is an app ready to use. We are not building the app from scratch. 
Is that right? Yeah, because it's open source. No, it is uh, what you see is only for demo. Okay. Right, but you can use it uh, ready to use. Yes, as you put it, ready to use. But you have to install it on a server, and you have to uh, configure uh, the web server. You might use Nginx as the front end or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You have to configure the data sources to point to your DICOM web server because the data or the images are going to come from a DICOM server. Okay. So that configuration you have to give. That is what is the URL of the DICOM server. If the DICOM server has some authentication, you have to configure all that. Oh, okay. Once it is configured, then it will work uh, right away. Okay. Now yeah. what we are going to discuss is the code if you want to build it from scratch. Is that? No, no. See, the thing is in open source projects or you, any a customer comes to you, it is very likely the customer will say change a few things for me. OK, OK, that kind of right? code. Yeah, so for example, I'm talking about this particular customer in uh, South America. So that customer, what they wanted was, uh, I'll tell you what they wanted. So here you have a basic viewer. And I showed you that here you can play the images. Right, you can play the images as a video. So this is all fine and good. Uh, now what the customer wanted is he wanted to combine all the videos of the entire study and play it as a single video. Okay. Kind so of now that mind. functionality is not there here and because it's an open source project, you can actually make a request. But we have no idea when that kind of feature will be delivered. If, if people will work on it only if enough people ask for it. Hmm. So what I was doing was to implement this feature where you can play all the images as part of a single video. So now because it's open source, it allows you have the flexibility to do it. And secondly, uh, this product is under uh, MIT license, which is a more uh, forgiving license compared to GNU GPL license, which is less permissive. Mm -hmm. So th that is one reason why it is kind of popular in the community. Okay. And people have built products out of this. For example, this can be deployed as it is. There are Docker images and stuff like that. Or you can take just, uh, it is also delivered as a JS package. The complete uh, system is delivered as a JS package. And you can simply embed this JS package in your own app, hmm. which is what some people are doing. That means they don't use this as it is. They built a bigger app for their use case and you they you embed this as part of their app. Mm. So that way it is extensible. So you can deploy it as it is or use it as a component of a bigger app. Okay. Okay, any other questions? So let's quickly go through the code. Uh, so I am also not an expert in the code. So now version three is implemented mostly in TypeScript. Now, if you look at the folder here, uh, once you have looked at the documentation and uh, understood the architecture, it is not very difficult to follow the code actually. So if you look at the uh, structure here, you have tsconfig.json. So uh, obviously TS, because it's a TypeScript project, uh, this is the file that becomes relevant. Uh, and if you, if you look at it here, which are the main modules? So we already saw in the architecture diagram, we have core, we have UI, uh, we have this I18N and viewer. So these are the core things. So this project actually builds four different packages. And all these packages are managed uh, by the learner tool. So there's a learner.json as well. So this, this is one of the tools, configuration tools to uh, use during the build. So let's come back to this uh, tsconfig.json. So you can see these are the things. So now let's take uh, one of them as an example, viewer, OHIF viewer. 
and uh, you can see the path also platform viewer source so let's uh, go and take a look at that platform so here we have all the packages code for all the packages you have core you have i18n ui viewer of course there is also cli which we saw in the di diagram uh, so now we are going to look at viewer and uh, let's look at the source so under source we have index.js okay so one of the things that this index.js does is it imports the app so straight away we can say that this is where the whole application starts app.tsx and uh, yeah so you can uh, this is what it is but uh, let's go back to index.js one of the things that index.js does which you know, all react developers will be familiar with it will create the react element and then render it within a particular dom element so our uh, so since since this is a single page application everything the whole react app is part of this uh, uh, dom element uh, which is uh, going by the id root so where is this coming from so this is also uh, wired here uh, so you can go to public html templates and you can see here index.html so this is the template that will be used for your app and all this will be bundled by your webpack and delivered so now you see here div id root so in this root the entire app is loaded react app is loaded okay so this is a very basic view of uh, how the thing starts and the app has a manifest dot uh, manifest file as well uh, it uses tailwind css okay some of you may be fam familiar with tailwind so that is being used uh, now this uh, ui uh, component ui package ui package is basically reusable react components so that is how it is built and if you open up the components here source components you will see uh, everything is uh, nicely organized so you have button then you have button groups so let's take an example simple example from the ui so you can see here there are three buttons but they are not independent buttons they form part of a group so that comes from here so you have a button you have a button group so the thing is the uh, main thing about any uh, designing reusable ui components is you should be able to look at your ui and see how you want to uh, uh, like what kind of components you want to design so it is not a monolith we have to see uh, everything is a component this is a component this toolbar is a component and within the toolbar you have buttons those are components each button has a tool tip so that is again a component so this is how reuse happens so you don't have to build the same component again so that is what we see here components you have a button button group so if you go to button group let's look at the code so finally it will return a div right it will return a div with these attributes and so on so let's say if we do a right click on this we should see the same thing so you can see here div role group group button class so this div role group is coming from your react component it's coming from here which is part of the button group component and uh, yeah so this is how we uh, kind of compose a complex app from simple components so this is the basic thing i, I have wanted to introduce uh, understood about the app uh, any questions at this point any questions
No questions. Okay. So one of the uh, reasons why I do this sometimes is that uh, uh, there is only so much as a programmer or as a beginner, there is only so much you can learn from documentation. And a lot of times the documentation uh, will give, uh, will uh, state the facts as if it's a specification. And example code may be missing. So that is where uh, tutorials are helpful, but tutorials are not often produced by uh, open source teams. Unless somebody uh, takes interest, tutorials are not produced. So how do we actually learn uh, from open? Uh, how do we learn something then if uh, tutorials are th not there or further help is not there? So one of the best ways I found is to study open source code. Because firstly, code is open. Secondly, uh, it is written by a lot of contributors and uh, one person reviews the work of others. So typically the quality is, uh, uh, of course, it's better than, uh, you know, what a single developer would write. So studying open source and the two, if the project has a good following, it's been around for a while, it has matured, then those are the pro kind of projects you should take up. Uh, you should study their code. So that is uh, like that will take your learning to the ne next level rather than simply looking at the documents. So documents will get you only so far. So what I found from my experience is to look at some good open source projects, download the code and study the code. So that helps quite a lot in uh, you know taking the knowledge to the next level. Okay, so uh, so as a conclusion, uh, those of you who want more information, head head to this page. This is not yet published, but uh, I think I will be able to publish it by Sunday. So head to this page, uh, you will get more information about uh, this particular software. And it's got useful links to the project. So this is the main site, documentation, demo, and then code on GitHub, Docker image. And of course, I showed you also already the cheat sheet and stuff like that. Yeah.